Hi, and welcome to the Flute Talk Podcast, where we talk about all things flute. If you're looking for more tips or lessons with from Emily, please check out Musigy.com for all the sheet music, transcriptions, albums, books, and flute lesson packages. That's Musigy.com. M-U-S-O-G-Y.com. Also, if you're looking for posters, fingering charts, or merch, you can head over at our merch store at store.theflutechannel.com for all your flute needs. If you want to help us on a monthly basis, you can also consider joining us over at Patreon for as little as $2 a month. This helps us make more great content for you. Check the description for more info. Finally, if you're looking into buying a flute, please consider using the Flute Center of New York and use our code TFC for a 10-day trial in trying three flutes. Check the description for all the details. Now on with the show. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Flute Talk Podcast. I'm Nick. And I'm Emily. How's it going, Emily? Good. How are you? Good. Happy New Year to all our listeners and fellow musicians and everybody like that. Today we're going to talk about um, our favorite like flute techniques and like what do you usually want to use, Emily, and me too, and uh, for yourself and also particular stuff that you would like to give to maybe beginners or, you know, intermediates. Maybe My a favorite difference. technical exercises. That's right. Yeah, technical exercises. Yeah, I really uh, enjoy the Reichert book a lot. Do you say Reichert? Reichert? Never sure of this one. Oh, I'm never sure either. No, I don't know. Like I say, uh, Reichert, but you uh, say Reichert, and uh, I used to yeah. hear Reichert, but whatever. Uh, it's 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 very good. <laughs> you have like what six different exercises? You have scales, At arpeggios, least, yeah. and chromatic scales. And what I like about them is that they have some. Um, they're written musically, right? You know, it's it's like a real musical phrase. Mm-hmm. It's not just da 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 da. da. It's mm. <laughs> they make a melody with the arpeggio, you know, or with the scale or with the. So I really like that, um, and I tend to work on different aspects. You know, sometimes I even use some of them for sound. Uh, sometimes it's really for technical purposes, like really finger technique. Sometimes I work my articulations my with with that, um, but yeah, I really like that book particularly and then like there's also uh, obviously uh Tafanel and Gobert the the daily exercises there's a lot of exercises in there that I think are very useful to develop mm-hmm, a strong mm-hmm, technique mm-hmm. like EJ1 totally. and 2 EJ4 is a good way to do your scales EJ4 is is also very melodic it's a melodic way to to practice scales and then um EJ five for the chromatic scales, EJ six for the for the scales in thirds and sixths. Right. Um, EJ seven is kind of cool too, especially if you do it one octave higher. It's very good for practicing your third octave, little repeating notes. You know, like you, you take three notes and you make a, a loop with them. Oh yeah. So that's pretty good. But what I think is like, if you want to build something strong. Don't try to do a whole book in one day, every day. Like, just pick an exercise or two Mm -hmm. and practice that for a long time. Okay. So that that you develop automaticisms. Mm -hmm. It becomes, like, you don't have to think. It becomes easy and fast. And then you just... uh, you, that's how you develop a good technique, you know? Mm-hmm. Like when I was doing my bachelor's degree, I would practice technical stuff like that for, let's say, 45 minutes. And I'd have like one scale that I would do in EJ, EJ4, like and the relative, and one exercise like EJ1. Mm-hmm. And that was it, 45 minutes a day for a whole week, then I would switch. Mm-hmm. That's how you, you do it without thinking after a while. Right. And then the fingers just yeah, go yeah. on their own. So that's, I think... But then you have to move on as well at one point and go back to it. You know, it's a whole balance. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, like, it's, would you, wouldn't you also say, like, maybe, you know, a practicing a musical instrument is sort of like, like, say, going to the gym a little bit. Like, but in a gym, you have multiple exercises. You really think a couple exercises as opposed to maybe, you know, you switch every day for, f- for your flute exercises. You know, you do a certain amount one day, then you do another type the next day and then maybe go back to the other or how would you rotate that around or do you think there are similarities or how people can kind of go into it at first because a lot of people go into 
you know, when they first start out on flute and stuff like that, or any musical instrument, they, a practice regimen is really, they get a lot of different types of information. Do you think just easing them in first is something that uh, you okay, would Okay, uh, there's a lot of aspects in your question. Like, let's start with just uh, the gym uh, analogy. Yeah, I'm just curious. I'm not a gym specialist, mm-hmm. um, but like, yeah, but in a way, you also have to do repetition of the same exercises if you want that oh, muscle okay. group yeah, yeah. to develop, I guess, you know. Right. So, and then maybe after a while, you're going to change your program. Mm-hmm. What I understand is people do a program for a little couple of months and then they change their program. You know, you yeah. have to stick to it a little bit. Yeah, stick to this program that you give to yourself usually. Okay. So like even with, like with the, like you said, with EJ1, EJ2 and all those things like that. Like yeah, instead of trying to do EJ1 on Monday, EJ2 on, s- on Tuesday. Right. And no, no, no. Like okay. even with, with students who are less advanced, I say learn two l- two lines this week. Okay. And so only wor- work on those two lines. Of that exercise. Yeah. And That's smart. You know, mm-hmm. then when they get a bit more comfortable with it, I'm like, this week you can work on one page. Mm-hmm. And then I increase. And when I feel like we've worked on that for a while and it's kind of getting old, I switch. I, I say, okay, let's work on something else now. But then maybe... In a few weeks or months, we'll go back to it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, but this time, mm-hmm. they won't have to learn it line by line. They'll learn, like, they'll practice the whole thing, mm-hmm, you mm-hmm. know? So, yes, they're switching around, but not too fast. Cool. Like, don't stay too long. Don't stay five years on the same. Uh, you'll get bored. You won't want to practice anymore. Like, if you feel, ah, oh, I don't want to practice that mm-hmm, anymore, mm-hmm. you should stop and s- switch. And, like... If you have a teacher, you should be open with your teacher and say, you know, that exercise, I can't take it anymore. Yeah, I like something else, you know. There are so many exercises. Oh, I yeah. can't believe your teacher can't find something else, you yeah, know. Yeah, it's like unlimited, you know. Like there's a lot of different things. Yeah, so there's like so much. Maybe I would have two different approaches. Maybe I would re-explain if I really think that that exercise is necessary for my student. I would re explain the goal of the exercise mm-hmm, mm-hmm. to make sure like it's really well understood that we're doing it for that purpose maybe also i would ask how mo- how many minutes do you work on that every day maybe you overwork that or you know or just find something else yeah you know it's true and maybe maybe it's a bit too difficult for now and we'll go back to it in a few months mm-hmm, mm-hmm. maybe we won't go back to it because you really hate it and we'll find something else to work on the same goal but in a different way mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah oh that's so interesting like yeah that's a uh, when you mentioned like ej1 and all those things that's from a, a book that you can get for free on on imslp it's a uh, taffanel and gobert so like if you guys need to find that or you want to cross-reference with what we're talking about you can go there and find that and uh, it's, it's called a, it's a 20 daily exercises i think yeah it has several different names it also has th- because there's also a bigger book that's part of that smaller book uh and they're all on the same page on imslp but if you look for tefanel or you look for gobert on imslp.org you'll find the complete tefanel and gobert and, and it has that book within that book okay uh the smaller version it's there too i think but but the whole thing is there, and that's where you will have mm-hmm. basically all the technique you want to uh Yeah, there's a use. lot in there. There's a lot. It's a big, good chunk of that stuff. Yeah. But I, I really like your ideas like that to kind of just conform to a couple lines at a time so that we can you can really get comfortable with those exercises as opposed to rushing through them when you're not really supposed to kind of rush through them yet. Yeah, because the problem is if if you're trying to learn the whole thing, you know, like your memory works, you have you have two types of memory. Okay. You have your short term memory and your long term memory. Mm. Your short term memory can hold what I think it's like around seven seven items. Okay. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But your long term memory is uh, is unlimited. So when you're repeating something enough it goes in your long-term memory mm-hmm. because like let's say you're trying to learn ej1 the whole thing you've never seen that you're a beginner by the time you get to the fourth line you don't remember the first line because your short-term memory is completely used up already mm-hmm. but if you do the first line five six times then there's a chance that 
part of it at least is now in your long-term memory. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So your goal, if you really want to master an instrument, should be to put stuff in your long-term memory, not just go through th- stuff so that you can say, look, I, w- I went through it. You know what I mean? Right, right. So, yeah, that's... Uh, I hope I'm clear about the goal of repeating a shorter chunk of... Uh, of a certain exercise. Yeah. There and are then, some exercises that don't Then your require. brain makes makes bigger chunks. Okay, like, okay. Let's say you're a real beginner. Maybe an item for you is one note. Right, exactly. If you're uh. an intermediate, maybe an item for you is a, s- a chunk of four or five notes. Mm-hmm. But like for you as a professional flutist, probably an item for you is like a full scale, an arpeggio, like because you see music and you analyze it without even noticing. Okay. So you see uh, when you read, I'm sure that you see, oh, here's a D major uh, scale in thirds, let's mm-hmm, see. Mm-hmm. Like you don't really say that in your head, but you see the pattern and you read it. And your fingers have done that scale so many times that, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It goes in your long-term memory and that that chunk of 20 notes maybe right. becomes one item for yeah. you. <laughs> exactly. But you have to yeah. build that. Mm-hmm. Like it's not built in one day. No, exactly. Yeah. Oh, well, Esther, well, let's just jump to a question if you don't mind. Um, Esther here, he wants to know what is a great routine for a sax player doubling on the flute now? I know like your five minute uh, warm up for flutists in a hurry can be pretty adaptable for people like them, I think, because we've had a lot of people when we first released that a couple years ago that were doublers. I got a couple yeah. messages from that. Um, yeah, I think it would be a good one because you have a lot of sound exercises in there and you have some chromatic scales. So, yeah. like, th- most fingerings are the same with the saxophone, maybe yeah. except for the F sharp. Right. And maybe the third octave, I don't know. Yeah, you can find that video. And then uh, I think y- to get that sheet music, you have to go on the Patreon uh, and subscribe for at least one month and when we give it to you. So you can uh, do that if you want. Um but you can also transcribe it if you want on our off the video if you're a sax yeah, player. Yeah, it's pretty you know simple. I mean? It's, it's pretty like simple, but it works very well. Yeah, long tone harmonics, sca- like a little bit of intonation, I think. Right. Yeah. Stuff like that, because like you'll see that the intonation is different on the sax and on the flute. Yeah. We don't have the same tendencies. Yeah, and the leaps are different with the amount of energy you give to the instrument as well. You know. Yeah. So your exercise really helps with that, I think. You know, kinds of gives a reacclimates yourself to the flute no matter yeah but i'd I'd say if you're a saxophone player you might not have to work as much on finger technique stuff Mm -hmm. what i would tell you to to work on would be sound because that's usually the big issue with with doublers and um maybe work on your um how you hold the flute Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because like i think that if you have a good technique on the sax as long as you're not holding your flute with your um, moving fingers, you'll be fine. What I mean by that is sometimes people hold their flute with some fingers that are supposed to be moving mm-hmm, to mm-hmm. play fast. Mm-hmm. And those fingers being involved in holding the flute, then they're not free to move properly. So wow. make sure you have a good, not not just posture. Mm-hmm. That's not really it. It's like the way you hold your flute. <laughs> Yeah, like yeah. you That's really use the right fulcrum points and all that. Yeah, good first step for and sure. And if you have that, you'll have a, you'll have a better technique, and you'll have a more, um, your sound, will also be more um, stable, mm-hmm. because if the flute is rocking, then the embouchure will change and all that, and maybe a thumb board could be a good idea. That too, it's true. Yeah. It's true. Um, he's also wondering like. If uh, I don't remember the actual the whole thing of that video and that and that sheet music, but is um is there also low note approaches in that me- in that um, in that sheet music that that in the five minute uh, warm up? There's I a little bit of low. I think they're low. There's there's harmonics. So harmonics kind of works on both the low notes and the high notes. But mm-hmm. um, there's long tones that go all the way to the low notes. There's also articulation that oh, are yeah, that's right. All the articulation exercises I tend to do in the low register Mm -hmm. because it's way more difficult to articulate in the low register than in the high register. And that's because the flute responds a little bit slower Mm. in the low register Mm. because you have to fill the whole flute with air compared to the high register where it's like it's way quicker. So it's easier to articulate. So when I work on articulation, 
I tend to do it more in the low register because if I can do it there, then I can do it everywhere. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, <laughs> it's like New York, mm-hmm. New York. That's so, it. Um, yeah. So th- that's that can help you working on articulation in the low register. Mm-hmm. But we also have a video about the low register itself. It's true. We have a video about going from the high notes to the low notes as well because mm-hmm. sometimes it's a leaps that are a bit difficult for people mm-hmm. so you can check that in yeah. general if you want to play low notes you want to have um, slower air speed mm. so uh, blow some warm air in your hand and try to play with that type of of yeah. air speed right. and also uh, don't tighten too much the embouchure mm-hmm. you know? because the speed of the air is what's giving it that the speed of the air is compensate will compensate for will compensate because if you have it too tight and you have too fast, it's just going to be a way more harder to control. Or it's just going to go high. Or it's just going to go high as well. Yeah, sorry, yeah. exactly. You're you right. won't be able yeah. to have a you'll you'll yeah. reach the second octave. Yeah, exactly. So you need to relax a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. But I explained it way better and more yeah, in this detail is just a in the yeah, video. video. Yeah, so yeah. So you can go back and listen to it and un- and, com- and understand it more. That's a well invested five minutes. Totally, you know? totally. <laughs> yeah, it's so true. Um, Meteors and astronomy wants to know. I'm an amateur flute player, uh, and I always want to know how to make higher notes sound less airy and more melodic. Uh, it's really quite a bit of trouble for me. That's a very common problem for a lot of people. <laughs> oh yeah, high notes. <laughs> You're not alone. What I noticed in my students is that very, very often um, it's like a self-fulfilled prophecy, high notes. Students are scared of them. Mm -hmm. And because they're scared, they tighten their body Mm -hmm. and then the note cracks. That's the first thing. Then there's other stuff. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) But the first thing is... um, Sometimes there are muscles that need to be tightened a little bit in order to get those notes, but people don't tighten the right ones. They <laughs> tighten their shoulders or, their, or their arms, their arms, their neck. But their back. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's it's not where you should put the energy. No. It's really in your airstream. Like, so le- if you do the sound S, do the sound S, S. and then <laughs> put your put your <laughs> hand on your belly mm. and like pretty high on the belly. Like I'd say where the ribs come together, mm. like closer together, and you do s- 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 and you'll feel the muscles going out. S- 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 those are the muscles that I use the most mm. when I play because like... That <laughs> sensation. It yeah. really helps to control the airspeed. Mm-hmm. So you want to push that in the high register because you want more airspeed. Mm. And then you don't want to tighten the mouth and you want to open in the back like, or like a cavern in the back. So it's closed a little bit in the front, like the hole in the front is small, mm. but in the back it's open. You, some people also think, uh, put your, like think that your uh, back teeth are separated from each other. Oh, okay. I've heard of people putting um, uh, pencil. What? No. no? Um, oh. Eraser. Okay. I'd never. never I would it. never tell a student to do that. Yeah. The reason being is. Let's say uh, you breathe in very fast and it gets stuck in your throat and you could die. I don't mm. know. I never told a student to put something in their mouth while they're playing. But just think about, you know, you can you can do it without putting mm. something <laughs> between I don't think I've, I don't think I've ever heard of that until I've heard from you. So I don't even yeah. uh, I don't know. I heard that. I don't wow. know. But don't do that. It's, yeah. it's a very bad idea. It's a big no-no. Just, just think of making space between your back teeth. Right. And, um, yeah, I also have a video that's quite clear about how to get the high notes Mm -hmm. um, and also how to get your octaves better Mm -hmm. because you should work on octaves and also work on harmonics because if you, when you work on harmonics, so a harmonic is you play a low note and then you have a series of notes that can come out with that same fingering. I'll Mm -hmm. I'll do it Mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. So let's say I play a low C. And then I'll play the series of harmonics, which is like um, the series goes like this. It's the octave, then the fifth, then the the other octave, then the third, the other fifth, and so on. So Mm -hmm. I'll just do a couple. Right. And that can really help you to get it, you know. And once you get it, then you go and play in the high register with the same air pressure, the same 
mouth thing, but there's not much happening in the mouth, you know? There's just a little bit of change in the angle. Mm. Of the so your top lip doesn't move, but the bottom kind of moves a little bit between low and high. It just moves. It mm. goes forward a little bit when you want to go in the high register. And then the airspeed does the rest. You want fast air, so right. you can blow cold air in your hand. Mm -hmm. And that's the type of air you want to use. Yeah, yeah. Esther was just kind of want to elaborate on that. Are you pushing the same amount of air for your low notes as you are for the middle register? I don't think in amount. I really think in speed. Yeah. Yeah, it's not about the, the volume coming out. It's about the velocity of it coming out. Yeah. It's about speed. Yeah. Yeah. Because if you have something, even, even if you put a straw, let's say you get the world's smallest straw and you blow in it and you blow in it slowly, it's going to come out as it slowly but if you if you blow fast air yeah. through that straw that that fast air is going to go through that straw even faster you know yeah i don't think i blow more no because you don't want to overblow either exactly i blow faster so maybe because i blow faster there's more air i don't know but i don't think in those terms mm -hmm, i don't mm -hmm. think volume volume i think yeah, velocity, velocity. And speed, yeah. I think volume when mm -hmm. I want to do dynamics. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Because when you want to play loud, you put more air, yeah, and you have a bigger aperture, yeah, and and when you speed. play soft, then you have a smaller aperture and less air. Okay, yeah. But then you have to counteract that with the aperture and the angle of the air so that the pitch stays stable or mm -hmm. as stable mm -hmm. as possible. Because mm -hmm. the flute is uh, not easy for that. So we're going to do about maybe two or three more questions about this topic, and then we're going to cut it for uh, this uh, month. Um, this year, we're going to be doing the podcast every other month. So we're, there's going to be about six episodes this year, but we're going to try to fill up uh, those other months with maybe just practicing again and a couple other little special uh, videos and stuff like that. So just giving you a heads up, uh, we won't be having one uh, in February, but we will be having another podcast over on, on March or in March. <laughs> <laughs> so stay tuned for that. Um, I guess I wanted to, to see this one question here about uh, Ryan. He wants to know, uh, do you know when why when I finger a G on the flute, it plays F sharp, no matter what I do when I adjust the head joint, it's the same? Well, maybe something's wrong with that right hand, I guess, the right hand uh, where the F sharp goes. Maybe that's down when it shouldn't be down. What do you think, Lily? If you play a G, uh, you finger a G and you hear F sharp, there's something wrong with your flute. Yeah, there's something wrong with your F sharp because if your G, uh, I know after the break when you play A, no matter what key you press on your right hand, it's always going to play A. You know what I mean? So say you finger an A and you move fingers on your right hand to close the keys, it won't make a noise. But when you finger G, it starts doing stuff. So that makes, if it's saying it's F sharp on the tuner, my first um, impression would be that that F sharp key needs to be adjusted or the spring has fallen off the spring has unloosened so that spring is not holding the key up so yeah, that it that, can be depressed that key here is always uh, is always down probably right exactly yeah but yeah it's, but it's the one on the furthest on the right you i know, think yeah. this one okay because no, look it's this one that's a difference yeah that's the difference so, so it's those two this one would be always but down. But you need that key down to make that key go down. Or so maybe it's the F sharp down there. It's a little felt. Yeah, it could be the felt or the spring or something. So I would take it to a like you said, either a, a well, you know or a the spring. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, or the spring. So it could be a small fix, like very, very small. Um I would try to find somebody if there's a flute teacher in your in your area, maybe have a lesson with them and have them look at it. If there is if you can't go to a shop, if a shop is too far away or whatever, maybe find a flutist that is a teacher. That would be my best bet because like what flute if it takes technician it to would be the best to yeah. do that because it's I'm a flute teacher and I'm not great at yeah, preparing yeah. flutes. So if you can find a flute technician yeah, if you can. Like if there's a music shop or anything, they'll have a a flute technician, yeah. or sometimes high schools will know where to call for that because they yeah. also hire. Yeah, call your yeah. You you should contact like the you're so that's so good. They like contact the nearest high school that has a band program, and the teacher I'm sure would be able to help you uh, guide you in the right direction of where to find a technician or yeah. whatever. But that looks like it's probably that. Yeah, without uh, you can have if the best. If it's uh, only that note. Yeah, if it's only that note, then, then it's, it's that. Then it's something wrong with your flute. It's something like that. So, yeah. And that's usually an easy fix, those types of things. If okay. it's a lot of keys, then it's different. Do we have another question? Yeah, well, we always have so many questions. Um, 
Viva Jess wants to know, how do you relax to remove the tension from your embouchure and tight air space in your mouth and throat and body as well? I grew up with a lot of expectation and I'm trying to get uh, rid of it slowly. Okay. Okay. Hmm. How do you relax? Because, uh, yeah. Oh, and she elaborates just a little bit here. Okay. Uh, I've been playing the flute for almost four years and have finished the Rubank Advanced Method Volume 2. That's the, yeah, we have that book, I think. But play with stress and it feels like my playing is smaller, airy, tone-wise, and going up high can be pinched. Okay. And sometimes the notes crack when there's less air uh, in uh, my... Oh, and then she sort of says, like, sometimes notes crack when there's less air in your mouth. Sometimes when I play uh, with more air in my cheeks, it solves the problem. Okay. Hmm. Okay. That's so interesting. So there's tension. Yeah, there's tension. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I would say, first you have to um, feel what it's like to be relaxed. You know about the Jacobson a relaxation method? It's very well known. Like it's a basically okay. mm-hmm. you s- you stand on your back and you uh, tighten some muscles for like five seconds and then you release. This way your brain kind of learns the difference between tensed and relaxed. So like I would start by maybe doing that every day while breathing. Like if you check online, Jacobson, it's it's written with a G. Uh, no, a J, mm-hmm. sorry. <laughs> yeah, Jacobson, <laughs> Jacobson. <laughs> Jacobson. Yeah. yeah. Jacobson, yeah. Jacobson. And if you check online, you'll find like find it explained well. And I think that could be good for you because then you'd feel like, oh, that's what it feels like when my muscles are tensed and when they're relaxed, you know? And then when you practice, what I would do is make a little post-it or a sheet or was something saying, relax your muscles. Mm-hmm. Because uh, you don't want to say don't tense up because um, the brain doesn't really recognize the negative your brain will just see tense up and you'll tense up it's like if i tell you don't see a blue elephant with white dots Mm. you see a white elephant with uh, you see the elephant in question with with Mm. an x on it Mm -hmm. you still see it so you you want to say a say it in a positive way like right give yourself the um, the command that you want to achieve Mm. not don't do that but do this um, so yeah, so it w- also works with little kids if you have little kids around. Oh gosh! <laughs> Instead of don't play with that, like just redirect. Uh-huh. Yeah, so redirect your brain towards what you want to achieve. So what you want is not to be less stressed; it's to be more relaxed. But you also need to have some tone. You can't be completely relaxed while you're playing. No, no, exactly. So you have to know uh-huh. which muscles need to be. Um, uh, activated to keep your tonicity and so that your sound is good mm. and which muscles don't need to be involved. You don't need to raise your shoulders. You don't need to push your head forward and all that. You can look at yourself in the mirror. You can ask people to look at you. But also just, I used to, and I still do sometimes, bend a bit too much forward when I play. And um, I would write on my stand, stand straight. Uh-huh. So every time I would see it, it would remind me. Because the the way to change a habit like that, uh-huh. I feel, is to check, do like constant checkups on yourself. And you catch yourself doing it and you relax. And you catch yourself doing it and you relax. I feel it's the, the best way. So maybe every day just feeling that muscle release, like, oh, that's tense, that's re- relaxed. Yeah. Work on your posture uh-huh. so that you can feel that's... Like okay, that's a good posture wh- where I'm, I'm tonic, but I'm not tensed, you know, mm-hmm. not completely relaxed either, because you'll have pain as well, like just tonicity, and then um, yeah, I think that's the the beginning, and then just catching yourself, and don't feel bad when you catch yourself. On mm-hmm. the opposite, feel proud. Oh, I catched myself, so now I'm on the right path to get better at it. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, there's a lot more questions, but we can only maybe do two more. But if uh, you want, you can always ask us in the f- in the in the comment section after the video as well. We'll try to write in some answers for you, or maybe answer them uh, in uh, the next month or the next podcast rather. Now, <laughs> uh, the one's in French, but and one is in English. I would when uh, we'll do the French one last, and then you can read that. And then um, the one I see here is uh, by Lewis. Here he says, "Thank you for uh, the live show and the response." 
Uh, is there any technique to for economi economize air, like circular breathing or any sort. Uh, can I just say just one thing about that? It's just like circular breathing is a thing that is a, a tool, but nothing beats, you know, doing long tones and, 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 and certain exercises that help prolong and, and, and keep and strengthen your air, you know. Uh, a lot of flutists uh, can do one minute you know, uh, phrases and playing for out without breathing sometimes, like, you know, and still have plenty of air because they practice that long way of Well, one minute and still have plenty of air is very, very uh, rare. But, but some yeah. people, they don't go out of breath. I've seen some yeah, people yeah. that are just like, it doesn't even, if I do that, I'm a little bit out of breath after, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> but I've seen some people, they are not even like, they just, yeah, yeah. they practice that, you know, because circular breathing is an art form in itself. And and, and it's difficult. It's one of the most difficult techniques to master. What I've been told is circular breathing. It's just this thing that's... Some people get it right away and some people it's more difficult. Mm -hmm. And I think it depends on the way your embouchure is. Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah, because like when I tried it, like I don't really master it at all. Um, but for people who... Uh, like my teacher who tried to teach it to mm -hmm. me said, it's funny because it has nothing to do with talent. It's... Some people have less flute, is flute ability and can learn it super fast. And some other people, it's for me, when I do it, I kind of lose my sound because it changes my embouchure a bit too much. Um, but yeah, you, you should work on your, like you can work on circular breathing if you want. It's a cool technique to learn. But I, like Nicola said, it's a different technique yeah. and it doesn't, change the fact that you have to learn how to breathe properly and use your air properly. Absolutely. So there's different things you can that you can do. You can um, first start by understanding um, different levels of air. Oops, sorry, like that's better. Mm -hmm. Different levels of air, like you have your belly, you have the, um, the rib cage, and you have the top here that the, that part doesn't really... Uh, the chest doesn't really hold that much air. Um, so you need to use not only the belly, because a lot of flute teachers say, breathe in your belly, breathe in your belly. For me, when I was doing that, I was always out of breath. And when I read a book about breathing and I realized that I was not using that middle part at all, mm. and I started using it, it completely changed my life. Mm -hmm. So also some teachers say, never raise your shoulders. Okay, so... I understand you shouldn't raise your shoulders like this b tension, you know, like tension raise is not good. But if you're going to breathe very deeply and completely fill your lungs and fill your rib cage and your belly, like mm -hmm. your shoulders are going to move up a little bit. Mm -hmm. If you're pushing them down like I used to do, you're going to hurt your neck. You're going to, you know, put so much stress in your muscles because you're going against nature. You're going against your body. So just just breathe. 3D. So 3D, I mean front, back, and the sides. Mm. And you can feel it. You can put your hands on your rib cage and <gasps> you feel your yeah. rib cage expanding. So you can work on those three levels separately. Yeah. And then also, I really like the, the um, we call it the square method. So you breathe in four seconds, you hold four seconds, you breathe out four seconds, you hold four seconds, and then you can increase, increase, increase. Right. I used to do that in bed before I went to bed, and it really helps with falling asleep. I think I'll start doing that again. It's very good. Mm. And sometimes I could get to 15 seconds mm. square. So it mm -hmm. means a minute, you yeah, know? Yeah, a minute, yeah. And uh, it really helped. And mm -hmm. also you can do exercises with your flute. Right. You can, like, take a big breath and blow very soft in the low register mm -hmm. as long as you can mm -hmm. and do it twice because the first time is never as good as the second time. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also in De La Sonorité by Marcel Moïse, there's a very good breathing exercise. I think it's in the second part of the book around page 10 or something like that. Um, you have these notes and then you have a spot to breathe and you have to use a metronome to do it. What I like about that exercise is it also teaches you how to use your air budget because it yeah. teaches you to um, do a certain amount of times, you know, uh, of beats mm -hmm. with one breath and then take a big enough breath to be able to get to the next breath. And so you learn how to budget your air. Right. 
it, it says 60, but if you're, you can start at 80 or 100, whatever, and then you lower it to, uh, to 60. Mm -hmm. So those are yeah, ideas, but there's good. some, we have videos about it too. Yeah, and then uh, our last question is uh, right here. You want to read that one? Okay, Sandrine Letuyer. Uh, quels exercices recommandez-vous pour travailler les sons graves pour qu'ils donnent riches et qu'on les entende autant que les sons aigus dans une pièce où on passe d'un registre à l'autre? Oui. Um, vous pouvez faire des octaves. Moi, je vous dirais pratiquer les octaves comme ça. So, yeah, the octaves, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Euh, pratiquer les octaves, comme ça, c'est une bonne façon de, de changer de, de registre. Um, so, the question was how to make sure the low notes sound as good as the high notes, especially when you change octaves. So, I That's say question, maybe yeah. change register. Mm -hmm. So, I said maybe practice octaves. Um, yeah, but you might need to work on your low notes also. Yeah, of course. J'ai l'impression que dans la question, il y a une partie des sons graves où vous avez un petit peu de difficulté avec les sons graves. Mm -hmm. euh, Peut-être penser à souffler de l'air chaud, détendre l'embouchure, pas sourire. Sourire comme ça, ça ne fonctionne pas vraiment. Vers le bas, comme ça. Alors, des, parfois, je dis à mes élèves de faire la grimace comme ça vers le bas, mettre la flûte, et puis ensuite jouer. Pas besoin d'apporter la, la lèvre d'en avant vers l'avant. On la laisse coller sur les dents. Um, C'est pas mal les, les conseils que je peux donner. Um, et puis, euh, oui, yeah. beaucoup d'air. Mm -hmm. Beaucoup d'air chaud, lent, pour que ça se rende au bout. <laughs> yeah. Voilà. There you go. Thanks, everybody, so much. Uh, Not much is going on, except maybe... Oh, oh une oh, autre chose. OK, go ahead. Gardez un bon angle, <laughs> parce que si on, on joue trop comme ça, l'angle est plus bon. Il faut garder la tête. Oh, oui, c'est vrai. You see, mm -hmm. in the low register, sometimes people tend to lower their head, then the angle is not good anymore. Mm. So keep the same angle on your flute. There you go. Whenever you move your head like that, move the whole flute with it. Don't move so that the, the angle changes and then you don't have any more... Um, Uh, how do you say, like, it's not stable anymore. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Keep it stable, and if you move, everything moves with it. Right. This thing is, like, glued there. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. <laughs> great. Oh, my goodness, that was such a great uh, show. Thanks, everybody, so much for the nice great questions. questions. Great questions. questions. You know, technique is always a great thing to talk about all the time. Um, be sure to go and like our uh, podcast over on uh, Apple Podcasts or on Spotify, and you can go and rate us on either one of those. That would be really great. It helps us out tremendously. We always get several new... Uh, Uh, you know, people joining over there. We always see the numbers going up, and that's great. We get to hear people, uh, you know, it's always good for people listening on there and also watching it live as well, or, you know, it's all good in that regard. Also, go to our Patreon if you want to help us out more. You can go to our Patreon and uh, help us on a monthly basis, and uh, that all that money and all those uh, goes uh, a long way to make more of our content. And speaking of content, we have even uh, more new videos that we just released uh, over the past two months, uh, a couple of new music videos. We're going to release another couple of music videos next month and more shorts as well. We're going to try to put some more shorts out there over on YouTube. So if you haven't subscribed yet or have just bumped into this page and you're just watching this live and you've never subscribed, come and subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's always helpful as well. And also uh, check out our book and method that Emily has created over at musogy.com, M-U-S-O-G-Y dot com. And there you can find uh, all of her lesson packages and all those things like that. And, uh, That's very helpful as well. Also, a uh, big announcement because we won't have a podcast next month, but most likely if you're in the East Coast in Boston, we're going to be having an event there at the beginning of, in the beginning of uh, March. Yeah, I'm um, so excited about be that. More, That's there'll nice. be more um, information about that in the future, but it'll be a master class that you can come and watch. And uh, it's going to be a nice, cool event in downtown Boston. So uh, look out for that information on our community page. We'll probably put that out uh, on there on YouTube uh, shortly. And that's pretty exciting. And I think that's a bit a bit for now. And then we'll talk about more stuff in March for the rest of the time. So if you guys have any more comments or questions, uh, be sure to leave them down below in this video if you're watching it. We'll try to look at them and answer them in the next show or make a video of it. Sometimes we do that. And also uh, be sure to like this video. Liking this video goes a long way as well. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. See you in two months. <laughs> yeah, see you. Bye. <laughs>